all new Mickey Mouse Club was a breeding ground for talent. The Mickey Mouse Club was sort of the American idol of its era. You had every child actor down there auditioning, lines wrapped around the hotel. I get a phone call and they said, pack your bags, you're going to be on the new Mickey Mouse Club. I realized, oh my God, your life is this character that Disney has to, you know, approve. I don't think there is a course big enough to be equivalent to the amount of information that we were given every single day. It was an incredible platform for these kids who wanted to pursue show business. Only Disney could create and maintain something like this. Nothing to lose. Leads you to where you are today. I believe in storytelling. It's gonna make you a star. I'm still trying to figure that out. It's been more than 50 years since the Mickey Mouse Club burst upon the national scene. The Disney television show was revolutionary. A show for kids, starring kids. Over the years, the show faded in and out of the cultural landscape. But by the early 1990s, it had hit its stride again and would become a remarkable training ground for some of the hottest young music and film stars in America today. I would describe the Mickey Mouse Club as a Saturday Night Live for kids. If MTV had mated with the 1955 uh, uh, Mickey Mouse Club, the, the spawn they would have had might have looked something like MMC. It's not the old show. We want it to be hip, we want it to be smart. Picture a show like Carol Burnett married with a show like American Idol. It was 1989. After a 10-year hiatus, Disney had decided to bring the new Mickey Mouse Club back again this time with a fast-paced variety show format. Well, the Mickey Mouse Club was a different kind of television show. You had 22 to 24 kids, so the show was really built around the kids. It was a rarity to have uh, 21 kids who were all the same age, young kids, be very professional as they were. No one could have predicted the impact this new crop of young Mouseketeers would one day have on American pop culture. Overall, I think the Mickey Mouse Club was amazing. The numbers of kids who came out of there who went on to do other things just prove it. Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Ryan Gosling, J.C. Chazé, Kerry Russell, all Mouseketeers who would rise to stardom. It's a phenomenon that might never see again. It's, it's kind of like the high school football team where all 22 players are all Americans the show spotted and then nurtured fresh, young talent. The all-new Mickey Mouse Club was a venue for talented youngsters to come and sing and dance and act. It really was this breeding ground for any young star who wanted to go on. And that's exactly what happened. They weren't fully formed when we found them. Yes, they were all gifted, but we kept the classes going. We kept working with them on their potential so that they would keep developing. And work the kids did. To keep a daily variety show on the air, each member of the cast had to be multi-talented. No kid entertainers in the business could possibly have gotten a better training than our show because they had to learn to act, to sing, to dance. The Mickey Mouse Club was a performing arts school. It was just a huge stepping stone. 1993 was the magical year. The all-new Mickey Mouse Club was at the top of its game one of the most popular shows on cable. But as the show entered its fifth season, the cast had grown older. The producers decided it was time to launch a massive search for the next generation of Mouseketeers. I think that the casting choices were true to what we needed for the show. And I believe that the reason for casting such young kids at the time was because most of us were on our way out and these kids would be the next generation. Amazingly, one quarter of the 25 kids the producers hired for the sixth season would eventually become superstars. If you were watching sixth season, you could have seen Carrie Russell, of course, Christina Aguilera, of course, Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake, Ryan Gosling. I mean, there, there's this whole, it really sounds like a who's who of people who would emerge uh, very shortly thereafter. The all-new Mickey Mouse Club produced more American idols than American Idol. Yet their phenomenal success came as no surprise to fellow cast members. Everyone on that show um, was cast with the potential, if not in the beginning, with their raw talent, 
By the time they went through the School of Mickey Mouse Club, they had the potential to rise. I can remember after the Mouse Club was over, watching them compared to many of the other performers who hadn't had that experience made it very clear that they were taking what they had learned from Disney and applying it to future careers. Disney was no stranger to introducing young talent to the world. Back in 1955, Walt Disney was looking for a way to break into the new medium of television when he devised a potent new formula, a variety show for kids by kids. The original Mickey Mouse Club was a phenomenon. I mean, it was a phenomenon. It's now iconic. The original Mickey Mouse Club was more of a display of what America should be like, and we're all perfect children, and, you know, we're really cute and happy. The Mickey Mouse Club would become a household name, the very definition of the ideal 1950s life. Disney was trying to be America's most wholesome place to be. And these were, you know, America's best, nicest kids that every parent would make their kids watch because that's how they wanted their kids to be. And there were those mouse ears. Every Mouseketeer wore them. And it was evident Disney knew how to market to kids. Every kid wanted one of those mouse ear hats. They very aggressively merchandised from that show. It was a great marketing gimmick because, again, even people who haven't seen that show know that show because they know the kids wore the ears and they danced around. The daily menu of acts would prove to be just what America wanted. In the course of an hour, dancing and singing, a cereal, Spin and Marty or the Hardy Boys, uh, a cartoon, it was always changing. Even though the show would be ingrained into the fabric of the American psyche, it lasted only four seasons. Annette Funicello would be the only Mouseketeer to go on to a career in show business. Annette Funicello is the biggest star to have come out of the first Mickey Mouse Club, and it's because she was also America's sweetheart, almost literally the girl next door. I grew up thinking that Annette was always looking at me on the television. If you try to put a face on, you know, the, the wholesome aspect of the 50s and 60s, that's the face that you see. And that was the image that Disney wanted to portray, and nobody personified that better than Annette Funicello. Disney tried to rekindle the magic of the original Mickey Mouse Club in 1977, but the show never clicked with a more sophisticated generation of kids. They made the mistake of trying too hard to doll this thing up for the new decade, for the 70s, which was a hard time to put any programming together because we were in the middle of this kind of cultural transition. The old Mickey Mouse Club song is now given a disco beat which seemed almost blasphemous. This just wasn't what kids were looking for at the time. And parents might not have liked it so much because it didn't look like their Mickey Mouse Club. After four seasons, Disney pulled the plug on the Mickey Mouse Club, but that would not be the end of the show. In 1989, Disney had just completed a massive new project, the construction of a new attraction at Disney World in Orlando, the Disney MGM Studios. It is to Hollywood of the 30s, what Main Street was for Walt Disney in the 50s going back to the turn of the century. It is a romanticized view of that great era that maybe never was, but we kind of like to think could have been. The only question now was how to get the tourists to come. They had this new theme park, the Disney MGM's studio theme park, which had studios, which they had to provide a tour for. That was the attraction. There was one problem. They didn't have any shows to put in their studios. It's a town that's been very much shaped by Disney. It was all about the many, many tourists who came to Orlando, and yet they wanted to make it authentic. And, and so they had sound stages. They wanted to put real productions there. And so as it kicked off, the Mickey Mouse Club was one of the very first productions at Disney MGM Studios. Disney executives wanted the Mickey Mouse Club to be more than a backdrop for tourists. They wanted a TV hit. But to make that happen, they knew they would have to reinvent the show. Once the 70s Mickey Mouse Club had been played, which was so bad, then you could go and do another version of it, and in comparison, it wouldn't look so bad. I know they didn't want it to be the 50s style with the mouse ears and these you know, very cute kids, and this is what we associate with being old Disney. So they wanted something that, and you know, the word was always hip. Their feeling was, to make it go, they had to make it more hip and modern. It was never about being what the other show was. It was always about being a show for, for a new generation. To make the Mickey Mouse Club resonate with modern audiences, Disney would have to leave some of the old staples behind. Gone were the cereals and the mouse ears of old. The producers needed hip, talented kids with star power to carry the show. But how do you assemble a cast of kids who are each one in a million? 
They wanted kids who sparkled on camera. You did it in your living room. Okay, hit your mark and do it now. In 1989, the Walt Disney Company hoped they had a winning formula with the hip new Mickey Mouse Club. Now all they would need were a dozen energetic, multi-talented kids. Casting director Matt Casella had the daunting task of finding them. Matt Casella explained what the assignment was to help find these kids, nurture the best talent, make sure they all worked really well together, so hopefully maintain this ensemble because there were going to be no stars. For Disney, it's all about finding things that eight-year-olds and their grandparents could do at the same time and not hate each other for doing it. Whether it's Ned Funicello from the 50s or Miley Cyrus now, it's kids who can appeal to kids and appeal to grown-ups. That's pretty much the key to the entire success of Disney is they didn't limit it to one age group or another. The exhaustive search would pull in some of the most talented youngsters in America. Mickey Mouse Club was sort of the American idol of its era. They put out this nationwide search for the best talent in America. The long lines of kids and their parents outside hoping and waiting and just praying that they, you know, get discovered. You had every child actor from the ages of 9 to 18 auditioning. It was just like American Idol. Everyone's practicing their lines, everyone's practicing their, their dance steps and their, their singing. They were looking for that three-prong ability, singing, dancing, and acting. And beyond that, they wanted kids who sparkled on camera. From the thousands of kids who auditioned, 25 would be selected to come to Orlando for a final round. They all did it on the Star Search stage in Orlando. So they had to take center stage and for 12 to 15 minutes do their audition on tape. Bam. One shot. That's it. They knew what was on the line, a seven-year contract with Disney. You're a 12-year-old kid. You're told this is your chance. Your parent is in the green room watching. And one right after another, these kids are getting up there singing, dancing, and acting. That's tough. In the end, only a handful of kids would be selected to join the Mickey Mouse Club. So six months later, after I auditioned, I get a phone call really late at night, and they said, pack your bags, you're going to be on the new Mickey Mouse Club. Ladies and gentlemen, the new Mickey Mouse Club. I realized, oh my God, I've got to sing, i got to dance, i got to be a Mouseketeer. So then it came time to think, well, are we going to move? Or are we going to migrate from Texas to Orlando every year? That was the next choice. The show would be produced at Disney World, so the Mouseketeers had to pick up stakes and move to Orlando. We're in Florida, and our destination is Orlando, Florida, and we're going to stay there for about six months, and I'm going to have a Mickey Mouse Club. Everyone back home in Texas thought we were crazy. <laughs> they thought, you know, she's 10 years old, what are you doing? uprooting your whole family and your home for this kid. I can only imagine the kind of stress and strain that had to put on a lot of the families to be apart from one another. But they all seem to really want to make that sacrifice for their child to be one of the Mouseketeers. Now I see how much of a sacrifice my family had made to uproot, to leave everything that they knew just for me. The kids had one big advantage. All of them were going through the same thing. They'd put down new roots together in Orlando, surrounded by other talented kids who shared their dreams. A lot of the Mouseketeers lived in an apartment complex during the season, nine months out of the year. And so that gave them a whole opportunity to socialize automatically once they got home off the set. That was it. That was the community. You didn't really know anybody else in Orlando, so that was your world. As the family settled in, the young Mouseketeers found they had a lot in common. As soon as I made the show and as soon as I was introduced to the other kids, they opened their arms and welcomed me. And it was awesome because having grown up in Oklahoma, I didn't have a whole lot of friends who were doing the same thing as I did. I think they found with the other kids there, kindred souls, other children that love to perform like they did. We all had sort of this um, camaraderie attitude towards working and uh, it was refreshing because I'd never been around that many kids that were like me. You spend every day of your waking moments with this group, with, the, with these kids, they were your best friends. 
Meanwhile, the writers and producers got down to work creating material for the next generation of Mouseketeers. If you were going to ask me the one thing I was most worried about before I came down there, we can write great jokes, but if these kids can't deliver them, we're dead. Not only did it turn out not to be anything to be worried about, these kids consistently, consistently knocked our material out of the park. They were that good. Yeah, we had a great crew. I mean, there was no doubt about it. I can say that I've never worked with a better crew since. I mean, this crew was on it. Everybody was right there doing a great job. The Mouseketeers trained all day. In between, they went to school. From the beginning, the Disney execs made one thing clear. School comes first. I remember this huge table with these, these seven or eight new kids around it and their parents. And uh, Dennis Steinmetz, the executive producer, said, I want you to meet the man that is going to be the most important man in your life during the shooting because he's the one who's going to tell me that you're allowed to perform. You have certain requirements you have to meet educationally. If you don't meet them, you don't perform. When the new show debuted, it was a resounding success, reaching across generations to kids and adults alike. The new version of the Mickey Mouse Club does get a lot of credit for discovering talent like Britney and Justin, but what it maybe doesn't get enough credit for is one of the first that really tapped into the new youth culture that was just starting to build because the boomer generation had had their kids and the kids were now coming of age where they wanted to separate from their parents a little bit and find their own thing. But watching cartoons wasn't going to do it. And so the Mickey Mouse Club and everybody behind it really kind of wisely tapped into that growing sort of generation of kids. We always thought of it as being a comedy variety show that just happened to be for kids. The idea for us as writers was to make it funny for us, for anybody. We were pretty much a groundbreaker in doing that kind of a comedy variety show on a kid's channel. And the lives of the young Mouseketeers were about to undergo a dramatic change. It was very exciting when someone comes up to you, especially a kid your age, hey, you're my Lynn from the Mickey Mouse Club, and which is so rare for a regular TV show because we were known by our real names. In the summer of 1989, the young performers of the all-new Mickey Mouse Club got down to work. It was a boot camp for talented young performers. Not only were they expected to perform, they were also expected to perfect their craft. The Mickey Mouse Club was, you could best describe it as a performing arts school. This was not a typical TV show. I mean, we learned so much. There's really no better place to train, I guess, than being a part of a Disney machine. There's, there's a downside because you're part of this big corporate behemoth and you got to deliver. But if you do deliver, it's, it's going to pay off. It was basically installing it into our routine, installing it into our way of being because you had to live on the set and with each other as well as work on the set. The kids were learning that to produce a daily variety show, they would have to cram a lot into each day. They were so tightly scheduled, these kids. They had school part of the day. They had rehearsal a part of the day, they would be at music rehearsal, they'd be at sketch rehearsal, they'd be shooting something. So they didn't have a lot of free time. And I used to say to them, you will never work as hard as you're doing on this show. For the most part, it was like a nine to five job, um, Monday through Friday. Some of you would have dance class at the dance trailer, some of you would be in vocal rehearsal, learning a song, some of you would be in the studio recording the song, and some of you would be going through a read through, these kids were worked like crazy. Uh, we love each other. Hey, we love each other! Someone. We love each other very much! Oh, yeah! No, I'm not crazy. I'm just a little stressed out right now. Ah! As the show grew in popularity, so did the crowds outside the Disney MGM Studios at Disney World. Tourists came from all over the world to watch their favorite show come together. We were part of the attraction at Disney MGM Studios. There were young people dragging their parents. We've got to go to Disney MGM Studios. We've got to see the Mickey Mouse Club. We were in a television studio with glass windows where we became part of the tour. The tour tram would go by our windows roughly every three minutes. Tourists would, would snap pictures and then they would go on their way. And this was all day long, every day. We'd be rehearsing or whatever, and we'd look up, and there would be, you know, a train of, you know, 30, 40 families waving at us, and we'd wave back. The constant exposure to tourists and fans would force the Young Mouseketeers to come to terms with their newfound fame. It's a very strange phenomenon, this whole thing of dealing with fame and the kind of success some of these young performers have grown up with. There was one time I was actually 
in the ladies' room, and this girl came out and said, hey, you're my Lynn from the Mickey Mouse Club. You know, you'd have that moment of... You learn actually very... early that as an entertainer the, the camera's never really off. Coping with their fame at Disney World was one thing, but it was much harder when the young Mouseketeers returned to their hometowns. Some people wanted to fight, some people wanted to be your friend because of that. You know, it was just constantly, I never knew where I stood with people. I just wanted to blend in, but it was kind of impossible. I guess you can't help that sometimes when you leave, sometimes, you know, it's hard to go back home. My principal would like put my newspaper clipping up on the wall and you know I just I remember kids would stand in the hallway and sing the Mouse Club theme as I tried to walk to class. It was it was brutal. It was brutal. The training they received would teach them how to be Mouseketeers on screen and off. We were representing a global icon which was the Mickey Mouse Club and we were instructed on how to speak, how to conduct interviews, how to hold yourself. The Mouseketeers were, were protecting the Disney brand by learning how to do those things very professionally and how to do meet and greets, how to go out into the park and, and work the microphone. It was all part of their training. The little bit of tours and autograph signings and pictures and, you know, being recognized in the grocery store, those little things can prepare for the big celebrity paparazzi kind of situation. The young Mouseketeers, however, were about to be educated by their elder predecessors. In 1991, the all-new Mickey Mouse Club hosted a reunion show with original Mouseketeers from the very first Mickey Mouse Club. For the young Mouseketeers, it was a humbling occasion. Annette Funicello came back and a handful of other people came back and we got to work with them. It was almost as if they were passing the baton to us. I had to create two numbers using both groups. So it was coming up with something that was hip so that, you know, the regular audience would watch and enjoy, um, as well as um, paying um, tribute and honor to these people who uh, created the show. In 1955, I was lucky enough to be chosen as a Mouseketeer. There were 24 of us, and from what I understand, they interviewed 10,000 kids. I think I was surprised to see how normal the original Mouseketeers were. It's just amazing to see so many people that we were supposed to follow in the footsteps of be ready. regular civilians, you know, without any kind of singing or dancing or acting in their day-to-day -day lives anymore. I felt it was history, you know, to get to be on this current show that was for our generation, um, to get to be one-on-one -on -one with the people who actually started the Mickey Mouse Club. It was, it was an honor for me to get to do that. At the end of the third season, the producers were happy with the success of the all-new Mickey Mouse Club. But as the 90s brought a whole new audience to cable television, who wanted to watch cool, hip, new programming, a vast change was about to hit the all-new Mickey Mouse Club. It was the early 1990s, and after three seasons of the all-new Mickey Mouse Club, the producers felt it was time for a change in order to appeal to the hip MTV generation of the 1990s. The solution? Hipper, older Mouseketeers. The revolving door of the Mickey Mouse Club was definitely prevalent in the middle of the seasons because you would have a, a pretty close-knit family, but every year someone would leave or come in. At the time, I think they were looking for people that would create a sort of what they called a hip tone. The new Mouseketeers they brought on were older than the original cast. The producers hoped they'd help the show reach a hip, edgy 90s demographic. Carrie Russell, J.C. Chazé, Tony Luca, and Dale Godboldo were among the new faces of the all-new Mickey Mouse Club. Well, season four was a definite change in the whole scheme of the show. We were very interested in pushing the Disney envelope at that point, and fortunately that cast had come in and they had the desire and the passion to learn as well as um, explore what they could do. Carrie Russell, Tony Luca, J.C. Chazé, Dale Godboldo, all of these people come in and they're older, they're hip, 
and they're all in their own right very talented. We were passionate about what we were doing and it showed and we had a good time. I think anybody that watched the show tended to love it. With this new class came a new social order. Tony Luca especially was really like the big brother to the show and the cast members. He was very much a father figure and a, and a, a sort of guiding light. Tony Luca was the jock, the musician, the kid that all the girls swooned over. And then you had Carrie Russell, who was the prom queen, the beauty queen. It's a complete little hierarchy that you would find in a high school. Carrie Russell was just the, the queen bee of our whole establishment as soon as she got on the show. And all of the young girls, they wanted to be Carrie Russell. She walked into the room and everybody stopped and just watched that long mane of hair and uh, just a beautiful young girl, very intelligent, very sensitive. They really brought in um, a power to the show as far as that teenage, um, older energy. But the new, more mature Mouseketeers found playing a TV version of themselves difficult. It was a very high expectation from Disney to project this very happy, excited persona for the camera. They're part of the Mickey Mouse Club. Every person that was on there was known by their name. I was known by my Lynn. Dale was known by Dale. What was interesting is this wasn't just us playing characters. I mean, we Dale was supposed to be exactly what you saw on camera and many times we weren't so really f constantly finding that balance there was a sense of frustration internally when you're on TV you're a little bit more on you're a little bit more glossed over the kids were naturally going to try to be a little bit more edgy the cast was growing older and they wanted to act and dress older as well <laughs> um, there were a few times on the Mickey Mouse Club where I would try to push for my um, skirts to be a little bit shorter. <laughs> I think the cast members had the opportunity to a certain extent to rebel within the context of the music numbers and take that energy, I should say, the, the energy of, of rebellion and put it into their performance. And that's what made a lot of the performances so incredible. There was a tug of war going on between the Disney version of ourselves and our real version of ourselves, being teenagers, ready to you know, in hindsight, it's rebel. But at the time, it's, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. This is what I want to do. This is who I, who I want to be. They would bring in people who were slightly older and, you know, more in the middle of their teenage years. And, you know, they've had more of a life outside of the show. And they had more of the attitude to, to rebel. <laughs> that older cast, I could have wrung their necks. The Mouseketeers sometimes needed to be reminded. The Mickey Mouse Club may be the cool, hip place to be, but it was still for kids. They wanted to come out whether it be in a song or in a comedy sketch, and just do something a little bit more outrageous, a little more cutting edge. And invariably, I was asked to go to them and say, look, we have to bring it back. You gotta remember, this is the Mickey Mouse Club. But there was a sketch that was supposed to be a used car salesman. The character's name was Slick Farley. I tried to make him a pimp. <laughs> I wanted to just really, you know, push it and go out there. Dale's an extremely gifted comedic actor, just straight up a talented actor. But he has a gift for comedy and he had this wonderful character that would be more appropriate on Showtime or HBO. So as good as the character was, and it was funny and all that, you really can't have a pimp player on the Mickey Mouse Club. Even Disney executives knew they couldn't stop the Mouseketeers from growing up. Ultimately, they came back with a couple notes and you know everyone sort of not only the cast, but the producers and the directors sort of nudged the network and, and said, you know, let's, let's rock with this. I think that, that everyone towards the end of the show had this feeling of these kids are ready to be edgy and they're, they're excited about making this as funny as they can. Being, you know, 15, 16, and being able to explore that sort of wild, really out there interpretation of a used car salesman was huge for me. In the spring of 1994, five Mouseketeers were ready to graduate from high school. The show turned it into an event. Disney had made, throughout the time I was there, a very strong commitment to education. They asked me to plan a graduation. The Mouseketeers put on their caps and gowns, and the five kids came out to pomp and circumstance. It was just a, it was a, a marvelous moment. I, I have always been appreciative to the Disney folks for giving me the opportunity to make education such a big part of their lives. With some of the Mouseketeers graduating, the producers knew it was time to look for the next generation of young talent. 
I'll admit that I was shocked because I thought they were looking for a hipper group, and I have in front of me a group of rugrats. In 1993, the all-new Mickey Mouse Club was a cable TV hit, but the cast was aging. Some had moved on, and some of those who stayed were already four years older than when the show first aired. It was time to begin the search for a new generation of Mouseketeers. As auditions began, casting director Matt Casella once again hit the road. This man went all over the country with his camera and found amazing talent. All you have to do is look at the roster of kids that are the graduates of the Mickey Mouse Club and you realize what an eye for talent this man had. Casella had discovered Carrie Russell and J.C. Chazé the previous season. Now, after auditioning 24,000 kids, he added six more kids to the cast. Among them, Justin Timberlake, Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, and Ryan Gosling. The new class of 94 was nothing short of astounding. The final revolving door was with the young ones. And it was a huge change because we had gradually been getting older Mouseketeers and now we were getting all of these young kids. There was some, I guess, hazing that went on from the older Mouseketeers who didn't want to be fooling around with these little kids. They were little and they were young, you know, little and young. So here I am, like they come up to my chest, you know, and, and they're just so petite. And I'm thinking, how is this show going to mesh? Mouseketeers who had once looked up to the older members of the troupe now found themselves mentoring the new kids on the block. The whole first month was about them really impressing us and Christina singing really loud and Britney doing a whole lot of jumps and kicks and just over exaggerating everything because they really want to establish themselves with this show that they've seen on the air for the last five or six years. But it was inspiring too because these kids man they came with so much talent and that same drive we had when we started you know so they came ready to work you know so there was never any like looking down on them and anything like that. The older Mouseketeers were reluctant to play with the little kids, but there was no denying their talent. Christina Aguilera sounded almost as good at 11 years old when I met her as she does now. She was this little four-foot-nothing little girl with a voice that sounded like Aretha Franklin. It was, <laughs> she, she was a freak of nature in terms of her talent. Justin was an all-around good little kid. I mean, he had good morals, good values. Of course, he was close to his mother, his family. He loved music, and he was funny. Brittany was just a dynamic performer. She was just very aware of herself and very confident, and she was wonderful to work with and would try anything. Ryan especially, I was very taken with because I thought he had amazing acting ability. The younger Mouseketeers formed the same bonds that previous generations of Mouseketeers had formed. Christina and Brittany were hand-holding, skipping friends. I mean, they were all over the hallways, just giggling, and um, they were the only two their age, you know, um, girls. So it makes sense. When Brittany and Christina got to the Mouse Club, they sat side by side in class. They shared concerns about schoolwork. They both idolized Curry Russell. Justin Timberlake especially learned from his elders. He was actually a fortunate young man because he was cool enough that he made friends with JC, he made friends with some of the older guys. I think it was kind of a surprise that some of those really young kids um, did fit in as well as they did in the very beginning. It was definitely like you know big brother little brother sort of you know these young whippersnappers coming on up all right let's show you the way of how we do things around these parts to give all 25 Mouseketeers a chance to perform the show underwent an overhaul the format shifted from a daily variety show to a weekly concert show we went to a sort of a concert format it felt more like American Bandstand in a way where uh, you would have you know artists come in and sing except the artists were the cast. And the show was given a new name, MMC. We started going by the name MMC. I guess Disney thought that might be cooler than continuing to say the Mickey Mouse Club. The producers selected a handful of Mouseketeers to record their very own album. So the album was really sort of brought to us as this is what you're doing. And it was just another part of 
our daily job to create the album. And we got kind of excited about it because we were doing something different. MMC was more of an extension of the show. Uh, we were still Mouseketeers, but we did a USO tour, we did a Target tour, you know, we, we did perform and we had solos and sang live the whole shebang. Pulling Mouseketeers for a side project was not a new idea, as Disney had done so in the third season with a group called The Party, a band comprised of Mouseketeers. The Party was uh, the five-person group um, that were uh, members of the Mickey Mouse Club, and Hollywood Records produced uh, an album, and they went on tour and they did music videos. So they took five that they thought had a good look um, and, uh, and, and could sing and or dance. It meant a lot to be in the party because that meant that you were an older, attractive, cool kid. Though the party had not been as successful as planned, the MMC album was the best way to transition the new generation in, while the veterans found another platform for their talents. MMC's later album, which was 12 of uh, Mouseketeers, but only eight of them went on tour. And we actually went on tour to Target stores uh, across the country. All of a sudden, they were living the, uh, the life of a pop star, miniature versions of what NSYNC became or what Britney became. But producing the show was becoming more and more of a burden. The show was very expensive to produce. The kids had reached an age where they were ready to go on. If you look at the last uh, cast production shot that we took every year, uh, you could see the older kids are not in the best mood, but the younger kids are just beaming. I think Disney and Universal found out that they could make their theme parts succeed without original production. We all knew it was coming. We all knew it was coming, and some of the older Mouseketeers were wishing for it. In the spring of 1994, the Mouseketeers were notified that the show would be canceled. I think the old ones were ready to go. The young ones weren't ready to go because they wanted at least one more year on the Mouse Club. We all knew we were going to make it. There was no question about it. We just had to finish this uh, little show called the, the Mickey Mouse Club, and then we're off to make it, you know, Oscar-nominated pictures. So we were we were all raring to go. The new generation of Mouseketeers had tasted fame. Now they were ready to take their Mickey Mouse Club education and reach for the stars. In 1994, the all-new Mickey Mouse Club was canceled after seven seasons, as it was deemed too expensive to produce. While the veterans were happy to move on, the younger Mouseketeers were just getting used to the spotlight, and they weren't ready to give it up. Justin Timberlake was the first to make a move. He teamed up with former Mouseketeer J.C. Chazé to form the boy band in sync. Honestly, I think Justin and J.C. hooked up because of ping pong and basketball. They had all the right stuff to to gel perfectly with those kids. I mean, it was almost kind of like they were meant to, to hang out together, and obviously that worked out. Justin was six years, five years younger than JC. I mean, they, they weren't in the same clique during the show. So in Seek, happening the way it happened was purely just the magic after the fact. Despite the age difference, the two Mouse Club graduates would go on to change the pop music landscape forever. I think in sync, first of all, they weren't a man-made band. Um, they put themselves together. Plus, I think, honestly, out of all the guy bands, the boy bands, they were the hottest. Justin Timberlake was, I mean, he was hot. Girls loved him. After a successful tour of Europe, in sync came home to perform a special concert for the Disney Channel. I can remember after the Mouse Club was over, watching Justin and JC perform at the Disney concert, how natural they, are, they were uh, uh, in front of the camera and how they understood that you sometimes didn't play to the crowd that was in front of you, but you played to the camera. Well, I think you can see it right after the Mickey Mouse Club when Justin and JC are in, in sync, even just from the music videos or from their performances on TV or even when they're just like on a red carpet event. Those two are very clearly out there, comfortable, confident. I think a lot of that happened during the MMC. In Sync, which becomes arguably one of the most successful groups of all time, this was a huge phenomenon. After four albums, In Sync split up. JC pursued a career writing songs and producing albums. The thing about JC is, um, you know, anyone will tell you, he's got more talent in his baby finger than most of us have ever seen, much less have. JC was very soulful. He felt things very deeply, and you can see that in a lot of his performances. 
But it was Justin Timberlake who would go on to superstardom. I think the whole entire NSYNC era, you always knew that in the end, Justin was going to go solo. Besides NSYNC, Justin's connection to the Mickey Mouse Club continued in one other important way. The young puppy love he had shared with fellow Mouseketeer Britney Spears had blossomed into an adult relationship. On season seven, Justin and Britney were boyfriend and girlfriend. So Justin and Britney did start out pretty early wanting to develop something more than friendship. I think people accepted Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake as a couple because, well, one, we remember them from the Mickey Mouse Club. They were the king and queen of pop at the time. And so it just worked. They belonged together. The relationship, however, would not last forever. After four years together, the king and queen of pop split up in 2004. He said he was devastated. He said, you know, he was really, it really hurt him a lot because of what happened. Him writing music and starting his solo career, it, it might have helped him. You know, maybe breaking up with Britney kind of pushed him a little bit. And Justin's solo career exploded with two critically acclaimed albums, Justified and Future Sex Love Sounds. Justified proved that he was a formidable solo act, but Future Sex Love Sounds proved that he was a superstar. Justin Timberlake would not be the only Mouseketeer to make it to the top. In the late 90s, Britney Spears burst onto the pop music scene. With three phenomenally successful albums and seven chart-topping singles, Britney Spears took her place as the queen of pop. Britney Spears comes out with her schoolgirl outfit and she sings, Hit Me Baby One More Time, and uh, that's it. I mean, guys loved her for the... the the kind of innocent sexiness that she had and girls wanted to be her and uh, it just took off from there. Yet the more successful Britney became, the more her personal life became fodder for the tabloids. All the other drama in her life, it just distracts from the music. Those who knew her as the innocent young Mouseketeer with the sweet smile are left to wonder, how could this happen? To see what Britney's going through now, it, it hurts. And it happened so quickly in a number of years, all of a sudden she blew up into this worldwide phenomenon. And I gotta believe that would be difficult for anybody to deal with that kind of scrutiny. The one thing the Mickey Mouse Club didn't teach us is how to be private. It's impossible in any way to prepare for the level of success that she had and the level of scrutiny and the level of all eyes on me all day, all night, <laughs> every day. Uh, I don't think anything can prepare you for that. While Britney was on top of the world, she opened the door for another Mouseketeer, Christina Aguilera, who rose up to leave her own mark on pop music. She used her big voice to win five Grammy Awards, as well as multiple nominations, including one for the critical smash, Back to Basics. She's amazing. She's got an incredible voice. She can dance. She's sexy. She's gorgeous. And I think if she keeps doing what she's doing now, she's going to be around for a long time. I think with someone like Christina Aguilera, you're pretty much asking for trouble if you speculate what's going to happen. I mean, if, if you go back to Jeannie in the Bottle and you decide, well, she's going to make this fierce feminist album called Stripped, but then people are going to make fun of the way she dresses and she's going to return with a double album influenced by jazz music. I mean, you, you couldn't really have predicted that. And it doesn't end with Justin, Christina, and Britney. Ryan Gosling is garnering critical acclaim for his performances, including an Oscar nomination for his role in Half Nelson. Ryan Gosling, for instance, is one of my favorite actors, and um, he was always a talented kid, but had no idea that his passion would be as deep as it became for acting, and that that would be his pursuit, and that he would do so well. You could see that in, in Ryan, the ability to take on many different characters. Ryan Gosling can be the heartthrob, can be the A-list Hollywood star, but is really avoiding those roles to do tremendous acting work. Carrie Russell, the so-called prom queen of the Mickey Mouse Club, would go on to star in the smash TV hit, Felicity. Her first big project out of Mickey Mouse Club was the show Felicity, where she's playing, you know, the wholesome girl next door type who, you know, is trying to find her way and change her life. It was how everybody saw Carrie Russell. Now older and more mature, Carrie Russell is beginning to make waves on the big screen. Her role in Waitress won her rave reviews and once again established her standing as an actress to watch. Meanwhile, Disney continues to nurture yet another generation of budding stars with shows like Hannah Montana and High School Musical, reprising the winning formula established with the all-new Mickey Mouse Club. I think 
what happened was they learned their lesson from the Mickey Mouse Club that they should hang on to these talents. It's like whatever we learned was so second nature because we did it so much, so young, for so long, that it's just like breathing. Even though the Mouseketeers have since shed their mouse ears and the Disney MGM Studios have since changed their name to Hollywood Studios, fans can look back at a young Justin, an innocent Brittany, and a determined Christina and watch them when they were just kids learning how to be pop stars. The Mickey Mouse Club for me was the most memorable time of my life. Just the most amazing memorable time of my life. The all new Mickey Mouse Club created an environment that I don't think could ever be recreated in terms of its ability to aggregate so much talent in one place. Their talent was, was, was just there and it wouldn't, I guess I could say, their talent would not be denied. Sorry. They were just that good.